First Peter chapter two. <coughs> Been doing our series on rightly dividing. Uh, last week we got up to uh, the new birth, spiritual circumcision. rehash all of that again but uh, that's what the new birth entails the new birth is uh, God's uh, Holy Spirit comes in with the word of God he performs an operation uh, circumcises your flesh from your soul and spirit and then he puts his spirit inside of you and uh, that's the new birth and then last week we got up to the point of looking at the different stages of spiritual growth. Once you're born again, then you can begin to grow spiritually. Uh, before you receive the new birth, you have uh, a dead spirit to God and the only thing that forms your thinking is the world around you. That's why this world today, because they've rejected God, is so into food and sex and uh, ungodly music and everything else that's pleasing to the flesh. Things that they can see, touch, uh, hear. Uh, it's just flesh, flesh, flesh. That's Amen. all it is. And the Bible distinguishes between the natural man and the spiritual man. The natural man is what you are naturally in Adam. You're born in Adam's image. 1 Corinthians 15 distinguishes between this, these two men. Adam was of the earth, earthy, and the spiritual man is Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us he was the Lord from heaven. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> the natural man is a lost man without the new birth. The spiritual man is a born again man, but in the scriptures he's referred to if Paul's talking to a saved person, but he's having issues with his flesh or not thinking correctly, Paul refers to him as the old man. That's the spiritual saved man that's acting like the natural man, thinking like the natural man. And he, well, how he is distinguished is he's carnal, meaning he lives according to the flesh. <clears throat> and then you have the new man. That's a saved man that has renewed spirit of the mind. He's got saved and he's got the word of God and he's changed the way he thinks. <clears throat> he's the new man. <clears throat> he's renewed <clears throat> in his thinking. So that brought us up to the new birth. The Bible says, a natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The natural man can't even know these things. Right. Try to have a discussion with a natural lost person about the stuff we talk about here and look, watch them uh, look at you like you need to be in a loony bin. <laughs> Amen. I mean, <laughs> I may mention this last week. I believe that, uh, I mean, they're over there right now trying to sign a peace deal, trying to achieve peace over the land of Israel between them and the Palestinians and all the Arab nations. I believe, I I'm, I'm more believe in a white horse that I'm going to ride back out of the sky one day and slaughter, watch my Lord slaughter the armies of the earth. 
I believe that more than I believe in the United Nations sitting right now in Washington, in New York City. Amen. I think uh, that's a vain endeavor that they seek up there. But First Peter, we got to the uh, spiritual growth and different phases of spiritual growth. <clears throat> the Bible uh, uses about five or six different designations uh, uh, for the spiritual growth of a believer. And you can identify where you're at in the growth as a believer based on characteristics that he gives us in the scriptures. I'm going to cover this one quick, but here in 1 Peter chapter 2, we see the identification of newborn babes. we got one mother in here. What do newborn babes do? For themselves, sleep. No. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> sleep. Newborn babes are pretty worthless. <laughs> I, I mean, they don't. They don't offer a whole lot. There you go. You got to offer them everything, right? Mm -hmm. They don't offer a whole lot. But First Peter chapter two, verses one and three. Here he says, he says, wherefore. Uh, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies. Remember, we're talking about newborn saved people, somebody that's born again. Up in chapter 1, verse 23, notice the phrase, being born again. So he's talking about people that are born again. And then he says, wherefore, laying aside all malice, A newborn babe will have malice. A newborn babe will have guile. He'll have hypocrisies. He'll have envies. He'll have evil speakings. But Paul says that you've got to lay aside these things. That's a choice. Right. People say, well, I just, you, uh, uh, you just got to overlook that Christian over there. And you got to overlook his maliciousness and his guile and his hypocrisies and his envies and his evil speakings. You just got to overlook it because he ain't been saved very long. No, I don't have to overlook it. Right. If a person's malicious and full of guile and hypocrisy and envies and evil speakings, it's because they choose to be that. They choose. When you uh, want to do things just for the sole purpose of hurting other people, you choose to do that. Right. When you come to church and you're full of uh, deception and deceit and you put on a phony face for the people at church, you do that. You're the one that's a hypocrite. You're the one that is full of envy of other people. You're the one that can't say nothing good about others. And that's why Peter says laying all those things aside. That's your choice. You have to consciously take those things and lay them aside. Right. Amen. And only then... The reason he tells them to lay them aside, he says, laying aside all these things, only then, after these things have been laid aside, can you be as a newborn babe, desiring the sincere milk of the Word. He says, as a newborn babe, just like a newborn babe desires milk, I mean, it's their whole existence, ain't it? That's a newborn baby's entire existence is cry when I want milk and cry when I have a dirty diaper. But their whole existence is that milk. That's why he says desire as a newborn baby. After you've laid these things aside, then as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the Word. You have to desire it. You have to hunger for it. Right. You have to thirst for it. 
We got so many distractions in the world today. Amen. Amen. We can find every excuse under the sun to not desire the sincere milk of God's Word. It's a lot easier to do this. I'm guilty, but it's a lot easier to do this <laughs> than it is to do this. I got stuff to do today. I'm not going to church. Can we just go this morning and not this evening? Yeah. But as the world babes desire the sincere milk of the word, why? Why do we need to desire the sincere milk of the word? That you may grow thereby. Yeah. That you may grow. This is only going to happen for people. Notice that next verse. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. You can take a person, if they don't have never tasted that the Lord is gracious, your churches are full of them. And you can set them in the church pew every service for the next 40 years, and there's people like that. They're faithful to church, but they don't learn to ever learn anything. Why? They never tasted that the Lord is gracious. First Corinthians chapter three gives you identifying marks of babes in Christ. I found a, uh, a message by Ruckman on uh, YouTube. It wasn't a video, it's just the uh, the sound, the, the audio, and it's it's this lesson right here. And I keep forgetting because I can stream YouTube through the speakers in my car, but I want to listen to that message while I'm driving. But I listened to about 20 minutes of it one night, and he, he went to the same exact scriptures I'm taking you to right now. And I don't even know the man. I've never talked to him. But he teaches a lesson on spiritual growth. And when he was talking about babes, he referenced the same exact scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Somebody read that. Somebody read that out loud. Start with verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Uh, unto spiritual. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are carnal, for ye, for where as there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Okay, that's good. One identifying mark of a newborn babe in Christ is they're carnal. They're governed by the flesh. Because they're governed by the flesh, you can tell them because there's envy, Strife, division. I'm not talking about no division. That doesn't mean we have to come to blows over every little thing or literally come to uh, verbal assaults with each other. Listen, the Bible says. Uh, that Paul's desire for us was that we would be of one mind speaking the same things. You don't have to be in fist fights and arguing all the time for you to be able to identify that there's division. 
If you got one person that's trying to go this way in a church and another person's trying to go that way in a church, that's division. Both people can be involved in things that are perfectly scriptural. For example, person A is out here trying to feed the home the hungry. Is that a Christian activity? Is something Christians should be doing? Trying to help the poor? Uh, James said uh, this man's religion is uh, uh, undefiled, pure and undefiled, that you visit the widows and the, the orphans, right? This person could be trying to feed the hungry. This other person could be out here street preaching. Both things are scriptural, spiritually based activities, uh, but they're going in two so separate, op totally opposite directions. Uh, that's division. But you can identify babes by envy, strife, and division. They're governed according to the flesh. These people are born again, but they haven't begun to war against the flesh. They're carnal. Verse 3, he says envy. Envy is something that Peter told us we had to lay aside. Before we could be as newborn babes, desiring, desiring the milk of God's word. And Paul says here, he says, I fed you with milk because you were not able to receive meat, but the milk hasn't done you any good. There's things that we have to get rid of after we get saved before we can ever begin to grow. Envy, strife, division. That brings us up to where we left off up with last night, or last week. Another group of believers you can see in the Scriptures would be children. Turn to 1 John. People say, y'all believe you should just cut out certain parts of the Bible and throw it away. I've done went to two letters this morning that they accused me of saying that about, Peter and John. I don't know why God wasted over uh, however many pages is in your Bible. The way some of these guys study the scriptures, he could have told us everything we needed to know with that many pages right there. They think everything in the Bible is the same. Everything is just the same. First John. Nothing gets me madder than a Bible pervert. The person that cuts out scripture or pretends like it don't say what it does say or rewords it so it can fit their doctrine. First John chapter 2. What's the first couple words you see there? My little children. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So he calls them little children here. Now look down in uh, chapter 5. And we know that the Son of God has come 
and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Let me point out something to you out of that verse. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us a what? An understanding. Why? That we may know Him that is true. You cannot have an understanding of God until you first know His Son. Amen. You have to have a knowing relationship with Jesus Christ before you can ever know anything about God. The Bible says in Romans, there is none that understandeth. How can a man, I get this argument all the time, how can a man repent of his sins when he don't even know what sin is. Right. Why? Because there's none that hath understanding. Right. The first thing the Holy Spirit does with a lost man is give them a conviction of sin. It convinces them that they have sin, but you don't realize how sinful you are until you start trying to have a relationship with God the Father. And the closer you get to Him, the more wicked you realize you are. Amen. That's why we're told if we confess our sins, He's faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As God reveals your sin to you, you have to confess it. And if you confess it, then He cleanses you of it. Right. If you live in denial of it, He can never cleanse you of it. Are you ever going to stop doing something if you justify it? If you think it's okay? That's why we must confess. Oh, that's okay for me to do. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, then you're just going to keep doing it. It's not right. But you can identify little children because they know the Father. And if you just liken this to uh, human beings, you can, you can be able to understand the difference here. Does a newborn baby, when you bring it home from the hospital, know it's daddy? Do you remember your mom or dad when you was uh, four months old? No, there came a time in your life when your mind began to start developing that you have your first memories as a child of your mom, your dad. I don't remember anything past back before uh, I was about two years old. Everything back before that's vague. A newborn babe does not know the father. They're saved. But you know what they're going to have? You know what they're going to deal with? They're going to deal with doubts, confusion. There came a point in time in their life when they realized that, that they were sinners. They realized that, that God allowed Jesus Christ to die and pay the price for their sin. They believed it and trusted it. They became saved. But then there's going to come another time in their life when they're going to start learning because they've received the milk back here as a babe, that they're going to without a doubt know the Father. They're going to know that He's holy, He's righteous, He's good, He's merciful. They may not know any of that stuff about Him back here. All they know back here is that they're under His wrath and they need to be saved. These people have just grown up enough that they realize they're saved, they're beginning to grow, but they haven't overcome sin yet. 1 John chapter 2. That's why he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. They know that their sins are forgiven. 
churches are full of those people, especially your Baptist churches. Everybody can tell you that their sins are forgiven and that they're under God's grace and they don't have to live a certain way or God don't expect anything of them and they have Christian liberty. Everybody knows that. Are your sins forgiven? Oh yeah, my sins are forgiven. Well, John said he wrote these things that we sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But these things are written that we sin not. That's why he told them up in chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us right. from all unrighteousness. The evidence of a confessing heart in the life of a believer is the fact that God is cleansing them from unrighteousness. Right. What, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Then down in chapter 2, verse 12, he says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And you can divide these up, newborn babes and babes, are two different things, but... covering together this morning. Little children and children are two different groups. Now look at Ephesians chapter uh, Now where were you at John 2? Verse 12. First John chapter 2. First John chapter two verse twelve. Having many things to write. Third John, second John, first John. I'm sorry, I said second. Look at Ephesians four. Wait until you found that place and I made you turn, didn't I, Chuck? You ain't found yeah. it yet. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. One thing about children, spiritual children, is they have a tendency to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Remember I was talking here a minute ago as a babe you're supposed to throw off divisions and strife and envy. That's what babes do. They're identified by envy, strife, and divisions. Well, once you become a child, you toss these things off so that you're able to receive the milk of God's Word so that you can progress to the point of a spiritual child. Then, he says in verse uh, Ephesians 4, verse uh, 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. You see that? We're all supposed to believe the same thing. <laughs> you hear people say it all the time. Well, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. And we believe that we should just all come together and love each other and just everybody believe what they want to. No, if that's uh, what's going on in your church, 
then the gifts that God gave the church ain't being exercised. Amen. Because Paul said there that the reason God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers was for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the, of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God Amen. unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But a child, he says here, that we henceforth from here on out be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Men like Joel Osteen. You know why people buy into his garbage? And yeah, it is. It's pure, stinky, runny, drippy, oozing. You know when you can pull your trash out of the trash can and there's a hole in the bag at the bottom and it just starts, it's dripping all the way across the floor as you're carrying it out. That's what his teaching is. And you know why people are carried about by it? Because they're children. And they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, just like a, a, a sailboat. If you threw it out on the ocean without a, 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 a sailor in it, What's it going to do? It's just going to bounce around. Wherever the wind goes, that's where it's going to go. That's what it's talking about here. Children, they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctor. I used to be like that. I used to be tossed to and fro. Now I'm pretty grounded. And all we know about a point oh 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 one eight percent of that Bible. But I'm still grounded. Amen. Why? Because Jesus said, if any man will do my Father's will, he will know if my doctrine is from above or if I speak this of myself. I just wait on the Holy Spirit to reveal things to me. I don't get my nerves all tore up because some uh, Facebook theologian decides that they know more than God does. But a child is tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. These Christians are not careful with what they hear and believe. They don't take God serious. When Jesus said, beware Many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. They really thought that he said, Few shall come in my name and shall deceive few. They don't take God serious when he said, Try the spirits, whether they be of God. For many false prophets are gone out into the world. Amen. They're just tossed to and fro. They think everybody carries a Bible is from God. You can tell children that are starting to become young men based on how careful they are with new doctrine. Which brings us to the next group. Young men. Young men are careful with new doctrine. I don't flat out reject anything when I first hear it. You gotta prove. I asked Becky, my wife, how many times I'll be in a situation and I don't say nothing. I go home and think about it for a couple of days. <laughs> 
And I'll be, I'll be standing in the shower washing my hair and the Holy Spirit saying, scriptures be going through my head. How do I handle this situation? I do this, that seems like it's right, right on the surface, and then a verse will come to my head and I'll be like, thank you, Lord. Young men are careful with new doctrine. <clears throat> They're careful with doctrine. Look at 1 John chapter 2 again. Verses 12 to 14 again. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So a young man is strong. Why? Because the Word of God abides in them. <clears throat> it ain't just something they use. It abides in them. It's taken up residence. Therefore, because the Word of God is planted up here, they're able to discern their way through this world. And because of that discernment from the Word of God abiding in them, they are able to overcome the wicked one. That has a lot more and it goes a lot deeper than the devil saying, here, look at this uh, naked woman. And you say, oh, no, devil. I don't do that sort of thing. Or here, drink this uh, glass of booze. No, I gave that up a long time ago. I'm holy. Overcoming that wicked one goes a lot deeper than that. If you study that word right there, wicked, you're going to find out that's a person. You're going to find out it's uh, going to be manifested in the man of sin, also known as the Antichrist, you're going to find out that there is a spirit of Antichrist which is also referred to in Scripture as the spirit of error. And if you really, really study, you're going to find out that there's only two spirits in this world. Amen. There's only two spirits at work in this world right now. That's the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. A person is either under the influence of the spirit of truth or, or he's under the influence of the spirit of error. Right. And I'm telling you right now, if all you do in your spare time is sit in front of a TV and watch CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, or The Blaze, you are under the influence of the spirit of error 24-7. <laughs> can a news organization, you can watch their TV channel 24-7, seven, seven days a week for the next year, and you never hear anybody on there say, the answer for mankind is that they get saved and born again. And Jesus Christ is the answer for mankind. And without Him, none of the problems we're facing will ever be fixed. Can you be listening to that and it not be under the influence of the spirit of error? Young men have overcome the wicked one. God has given them discernment because the Word of God abides in them. They can discern these spirits who have influence in the world. 
I know when I hear something, whether it's the spirit of truth or the spirit of error. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll cover this one, and then I'm going to be done for this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And this is very important. And I don't care who it offends, who it upsets. I'm getting ready to give you a clear Bible on this. Spiritual fogs. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Start in verse 15. Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. Corinthians were full of instructors. That's why they were so full of division. He told them earlier, one say I'm of Paul, one say I'm of Apollos. Blah, blah, blah. I believe this man's teaching. I believe that man's teaching. Oh, you believe there's more divisions in the Bible than just Old Testament and New Testament. You must be a hyper-dispensationalist. Uh, you must be an IFB apostate. Or you must be uh, belong to this uh, clique. Or this schism. We got 10,000 instructors in Christ today. Go to the Christian bookstore. There's uh, 40 shelves full of books. I believe this doctrine. I don't believe that doctrine. Well, I believe that doctrine, but not your doctrine. 10,000 instructors. But what did they not have? They didn't have many fathers. Now, let me show you this, and you tell me if I'm wrong. He says, For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Paul was their father. That's why he says, I have begotten you through the gospel. Basically what he's saying is, I'm your father. Therefore, be ye followers of me. Not these 10,000 instructors. Since you have 10,000 instructors, but you don't have many fathers, you need to follow me because I have begotten you through the gospel. I'm your father. And then he says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Notice this, Who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. A spiritual father is one that brings into your remembrance Paul's ways. Did I make any of that up? Is that what he said? What he said. Now, if that makes me a hyper-dispensationalist, so be it. Paul said to a bunch of Christians right there that if they wanted to be followers of Jesus Christ, they need to be a follower of Him. 